founder of our sacred space to introduce our guest today and also talk about the session ma'am you will have to unmute yourself so welcome everybody wonderful to see all of you today um my mother and co-founder of our sacred space will be giving you some insight into the tuning in series tuning in post pandemic wisdom the intent of this lecture series is to analyze paradigms of development and explore findings on environment sustainability and social justice the present pandemic has brought an awareness that all life is one deeply interconnected are all organisms the crops we grow the food we consume the clothes we wear are all given to us by nature's bounty we owe it to her that our practices are benign and non toxic the soil the air and all living organisms are equal stakeholders as we understand that our destinies are interdependent our ways of doing business politics agriculture social transactions and art could change and this crisis could catalyze that change i'd like to um welcome anantu thank you for being here today um i think most of us know about the width and depth of his work uh, but i'll give you a short introduction in case you don't are not familiar with some of it anantu sayana was a telecom engineer working in europe in 2006 he returned to india and since he works only on social causes for safe food and sustainable agriculture he and his colleagues work with small and marginal farmers helping them move to sustainable farming restore the non-profit organic retail outlet in chennai makes safe organic food accessible to the middle class i went on a pilgrimage to restore when i was last in chennai and um in addition to all the organic produce i also saw a huge variety of heirloom seeds he co-founded ofm organic farmers market a collective working with organic farmers and youngsters interested in organic markets he is the coordinator for safe food alliance a group of volunteers and consumers who want to ensure safe secure and nourishing food for all growing food that makes our soil fertile restores our environment and secures farmers livelihoods he is associated with associated with asha alliance for sustainable and holistic agriculture agriculture working on sustain uh, agriculture working on sustainability and farmers livelihoods he works closely with the uh, tamil nadu state planning commission on the millets mission most significantly he has worked effectively in bringing together coalitions supporting migrant workers during the lockdown and with tula he is working with cotton farmers helping them grow cotton organically then procure hand spin hand weave natural dye manually stitch and sell the garments tula creates an economy and breathes life into each of these livelihoods Anantu writes extensively on farmers issues world trade impacts on indian agriculture safe food and other ecological <laughs> topics welcome i'm waiting to hear what you have to tell us today thank you thank you nandara thank you shikara <clears throat> sacred space has always had a special uh, place in our hearts and uh, tula has already been there twice i was supposed to be there physically 
and pandemic didn't allow us, but it's good that we could at least do it virtually now. I'm very really glad that I could join one of the lectures here and talk about the cotton value chain, which is what we will do, and we will also to relate to further to our journey in the process. Can I share the screen now, uh, Shikana? Yes. So that sir. I take a presentation of mine. Yeah. Yes, you can. You can share. Okay. So I'll just quickly go through some of the slides. This is any anyway, long process. Uh, Tula was basically initiated by a few friends who thought who are working with uh, farmers and safety. We just thought there is a necessity to work with cotton also. So the cotton farmers were one of the most uh, suffering, you can say. They had a lot of crisis. We will also see what it was. And so we thought we will work with the cotton farmers, help them grow organic cotton, and then we will take it to the value chain. That's what we thought, and that's how we initiated and started uh, Tula basically. Tula itself means cotton in Sanskrit and in uh, the Bengal. In uh, so South Indian languages, Tula Baram means cotton. I mean, see, it basically, Tula Baram is balance. So we said it will also bring in equilibrium, justice and balance into the whole value chain. That was the whole idea. I needed. That's how the name came up. As I was saying, one of the first things that affected us was we were working with farmers and we found that Close to 70% uh, of the farm suicides that were happening in India was in cotton bent. And so we found that we were not working there and it is important that we work there and we just said fine, we will work in and see what it is and what is the best people to do because when we went into food sector and started working with farmers, we could see that year on year the number of farmers that we touched increased and the demand also, demand said also there was an increase because we were working in a convenient urban center. And we were popular enough, and uh, we were uh, they, by this time they had achieved some uh, loyal customers also. So we were we thought we will bring in the cotton value also, cotton value chain also into our field. That's how we went in. In India, five percent of the agricultural land could be growing cotton, but fifty-five percent of the pesticides sold is used for cotton. It's one of the very thirsty crops in the form of processing more than growing. If it is grown irrigated, there is a lot of water uh, there also. It is basically a value chain that uses a lot of water, a lot of energy, a lot of money, and also pollutes a lot. So it's a, it, it, uh, for us, we should also understand what is happening there. We should also understand what is happening in Khadi, basically, and then why and how we all can pitch in into this whole value chain. What can be done by us? Of course, there are some numbers, interesting numbers. Cotton is cotton has always been dominating a dominant factor of commerce a dominant factor of gdp a dominant factor of world leadership basically so to say and uh, i would say we would also see the historically what was happening say when and in the how in 16th 17th century it uh, moves into the uh, in the middle europe where data start taking up cotton as a business also and how they their as their empire grows the empire of cotton also grows along with them it's a very interesting uh, Saying to see cotton itself dominating the whole political and come on the economical epicenters of the world. So it's common, and then cotton has been a very, very interesting fiber in that sense. And of course, we all know immediately relate to Gandhi when we talk of Hadi, when we talk of uh, distributed economy, when we talk of Burma and the Jura. The relevance of Gandhi itself here would be highly about questioning the mechanization of words, the industrial domination of words, and where, how Gandhi, even in those days, very, uh, it is a fantastic thing that the man predicted that time itself saying we should not, that was the time when American cotton, the Hirsutan cottons were coming into India, and he, he basically stood up and said that it is not a good idea to bring in American cotton and grow it in India just because Britain needs cotton to process for their machines. Because the American cotton was long staple cotton, what India was growing was short staple. Short staple is always suited for hand processing, for hand spinning, hand weaving, and all. And we, if we had to grow cotton for the machines that were suited for long staple, then we will lose out on a lot of things. We will lose out our sovereignty on the seed. We will lose out. We will only be 
suppliers of raw material is what Gandhi did, and this is what happened subsequently. And he was also someone who said it should basically be a production by masses, not mass production. So it, he was against the industrialized production of you know, cotton and the cotton chain itself. And he was, as, as always, insisting on he and J.C. Kumarapa, they were always insisting on the Khadi being a village industry, bolstering rural economy. Just to uh, take some of you through what are the cotton uses, what, uh, been, what can cotton basically give us? What all can we make out of it? Just to understand what are the industries and are, what are the commerce possible behind it. It could be clothing, it could be bedding, it could be curtains, it could be bags. Wick is very, very wick, the diya the lamp for your, all your lamps, you know. That's very unique to Indian not basically you won't find it anywhere else. The bandages for the surgical cotton, which we find in every house. We used to have cotton plants almost in every house. They just used to uh, always uh, just pluck it, make their own uh, wicks for every house household basically. They always had this cotton handy if there was any wound, uh, any injury, and they would use the cotton immediately. It was always used for various purposes. Cotton was always had a ubiquitous presence basically everywhere, and it had so many uses around us. It was so easily available. Today, it is grown only as a cash crop in only the farm. That is, the, it has moved away from us. That's a, that, that's that's an alienation. That's a sad development. Okay, uh, to go to what cotton happens, what is whatever we uh, harvest from the farms will be the cotton, uh, raw cotton, which is basically then de seeded. Taking out of the seed is called the ginning, it's a process. So, once you take the seed out, which will be 67% of the weight of uh, raw cotton, so 33% is what we get as cotton lint. The lint is then spun into yarn, the yarn is then used for weaving, and then the dyeing happens either in the yarn stage or after it's woven in the fabric stage. And then the Basically, it comes out and it's finished as products. Basically, it could be garments, it could be t-shirts, it is. Uh, it depends on what, how the processing is happening. If it is knitted or woven or what, and I would be talking about the spinning, hand spinning, and hand weaving predominantly. Basically, that's what we also concentrate on. And if you were to see the industrial processing today, there's a lot of, as I told you, there's something that a lot of energy that's used, a lot of money that's used, a lot of investment that goes in, and a lot of effluents that come out. Money in, pollution out. That's the beauty of this cotton value chain, actually. <laughs> what is seen in our in the market. So th this is what it is. Spinning. The moment we talk of spinning, uh, we, uh, think of spinning, we think of this grand old man with, sitting with a spinning wheel. It's a fantastic thing. It's highly meditative. That's one of the reasons probably this man was always spinning. It is a Great art, it's a fantastic thing to do, and I think we all should say until at least two gentlemen, I mean, uh, one generation before us, all the schools did have this in their curriculum. People were supposed to spin. Spinning was always prevalent, and everybody was going against it. Sad, and there was also the mechanized spinning. I'm not talking of the huge machines, these are all the umber chattas, which are again uh, the it, it's a rotary with a hand, it's only a hand operated machine, which is basically came up in the Gandhi stand itself. It also has a very interesting story. I mean, that this is also goes to prove Gandhi was not against the machines. So Gandhi was instrumental in bringing out this machine. I mean, in 1927 or so, Gandhi announces a prize money of 5,000 rupees, telling people that there is a lot of luxury in the spinning and there's not a lot of output for people in that in a per day output. So basically, if somebody can come out with a small machine which our in, in rural Indian women can use and which can increase the productivity and which can increase the stability of the fan and uh, standard, I mean, if it can bring a small standardization in which and uh, there, there was not much response and so he increased that uh, price money to one lakh in three years by uh, 1930 and that's when the machine came in many ways, not because of one lakh, but yeah, it took its time. And then the yarn that's spun with this machine or by hand is then given to the weavers who weave. Uh, weaving itself is a very, very, um, it's a fantastic craft, of course. It's a very creative also. It's um, it also uh, involves a lot of luxury. It involves a lot of pain and labor. But it needs a lot of work to be done. Even before they can start this, they will have to do a few hours, a few days of work before this yarn can be ready to be uh, mounted as a bar. And then into the weft, you need to be basically they need to do the reading. So there is a lot of work that happens there, and it's it's a the output is fantastic. And of course, dyeing I and mean, uh, natural dyeing basically where the color. This is indigo, uh, all you see. 
And if you see, they are just using their hands and their teeth as the best tool that is possible to take out from the shibori that they are doing. It's a, a very, uh, it's an, a very interesting observation. Basically, it's the, if they were basically using chemical dyeing and if they were using his hands and uh, their teeth like this, they would have had a lot of other health issues uh, for sure. And this basically being planned for like uh, their dirty. I'm surprised that they, were, they could just work on this like this. And then they were, I just saw them uh, walk for uh, lunch, just like that, keeping this down and just walking across the line. Um, um, this is also uh, in male Kote in one of the places where we work with. And this is uh, dying with a pomegranate, basically. There's a, a light. For natural dyeing, you would use a lot of plant material. Basically. It could be myrobalan, it could be uh, indigo, as we saw, it could be uh, uh, pomegranates, it could be uh, various flowers, it could be uh, uh, butterfly pea, it could be uh, some onion peels, it could be any of these things, any of these plant materials. There are many plant materials. In fact, incidentally, in India, we have had so many colors, beautiful colors that they brought out, and we have lost that skin. We need to basically revive that and to ensure that these were also the colors were uh, put to the fabric or your uh, yarn basically without any synthetic mordant also. That's also something that actually we are experimenting can be ensure that the, even the mordants that are used are not chemical or synthetic. It is also natural. Worldwide, they are allowed to use chemical and synthetic mordants, by the way, in natural diet. This is basically from Clitoria. But, uh, <laughs> it's a beautiful blue that comes out and it's a very easily found uh, creeper everywhere. It's also important that we don't go and disturb something else. We don't approve the plant for a color for ourselves. There has to be a lot of thought that goes in. It should be a flower, it should be a seed, it should be, it, it should be an end of cycle product, not something that will disturb the cycle. That's also very important when you talk of uh, natural dyeing vis-a-vis -vis, uh, chemical dyeing and uh, so these are the various colors that we bring in and just before I go and continue to tell you what happens in the market, what, what is happening in today's uh, dyeing, in the, uh, in the today's cotton value chain itself, I just thought it would be interesting to just quickly look at the cotton's evolution itself and how one went. Uh, or the recorded history of cotton. Five, uh, there are records of Five thousand years before the common era, basically, that's in Mega, which is in Pakistan. We have seen one of the first uh, occurrences and uh, recording in the history of uh, cotton instruments. And then Mohenjadar, of course, we also have read and seen a lot about how it has been used extensively in the Mohenjadar civilization. From there on, it has always been very prevalent in our Indus Valley civilization and across India, everywhere. It was one could always saw it. And from the thousand, uh, from the common era, basically, the 1000 was the first printed. It's basically cotton dominated the world. Market. There are a lot of products that would go from here. There are a lot of visitors from Arabia, you could name it, from Persia, and various other places that they were always chasing and coming here to take basically our cotton and finished products of cotton. The French called it the Indian with all those crazy spelling of this. And then the, there was a calicos in the 1700s. I mean, I've already gone to 1700s. 1600s and 1700s where the highest domination of cotton from India used to happen, where our muslin was available and the aristocrats and almost all the rich and the aristocracy in the Europe will always sport Indian cotton. So it was such a big thing, the muslin for example, to the extent that they all record it and call it as a woven wind. And in the 1800s, it was basically again a turnaround where the cotton itself is the, I mean, the processing of cotton because of the because of the mechanization, because of the industrial revolution in in Britain, Great Britain, in the UK, they start basically they started the water-based uh, <coughs> looms, and then they had the sterling engine that came in and they started running it. They, when they motorized it, then they could uh, get thousands of uh, spindles that would be uh, spun, used to spin the thing. So that is the time when Britain's domination of cotton came in, in spite of them not growing one plant of cotton there. So they used to bring their cotton from the slave production of the America. So cotton always had its hands red. It always had a lot of exploitation. It always had a lot of uh, <clears throat> sin on its hands. 
so to say. Anyway, to complete the story uh, by uh, America grew cotton, which would come to uh, UK. UK would process it in their uh, industrialized that just then the uh, advent of their industrialization and their their domination into the commerce of the world started and where their GDP also had a big uh, cotton. So those were the days. I mean, just to tell you an, an aside, as I have mentioned here, is calico, which was basically one of those, again, like muslin, one of our thinnest, uh, the beautiful, finest cotton that was woven into bread, brothers, which were sold in there. They were so very put off. The local uh, businessmen in uh, UK went to the governments and then said they had to bring up all this, these cloths from India coming and dominating the businesses and taking up a lot of uh, their money. That's what that was. Uh, so they actually went to the extent of blocking. They even had an act, Calico Act, in 1721, when they, saw, when they said this was banned in uh, UK. Anyway, they repealed it in uh, two years, basically later on. And meanwhile, they are meanwhile their industrialization started. They also needed cotton um, uh, close to the uh, World War One. America was more uh, they were they were not able to bring cotton from there. So they forced the Indian farmers to grow cotton for them, and they would take cotton from us. And, and then around the after the First World War, uh, Japanese take over. Japanese come out with twenty-four hours mill, like typically where you know almost all the industries that they did it. They needed to cotton also, or they took over cotton for some time. And then during the same time, uh, Gandhi is also uh, creating created a big flutter here by saying we should not be supporting the, uh, the cotton that was processed in uh, Europe, especially in uh, UK, where they are basically forcing us to grow a cotton that is suitable only for their machine and they are asking and uh, they are taking it there as raw material and bringing a finished product and selling it on our hands. So we are we are deprived of the whole economy of the whole commerce that comes in. That was the depth of Gandhi to, uh, Gandhi's understanding in those days when nobody else was talking about it. And when he, and he went to the extent of saying talking about boycotting the British cotton dresses and people did do. Um, though in those days, Khadi was costlier than the British uh, garments and still people did that. And when Gandhi announced it and Gandhi went on a big uh, fight against this and uh, was uh, advocating boycott British cotton. The close to 74 mills that closed down in the Manchester and that area. That, there's a very interesting story there. Gandhi was told that those people who lost the job, they're uh, very livid and he goes there and has a conversation with them and convinces them and those people tell him that we are with you. You go back and continue to do what you are doing. We might have lost the job, but we are not uh, livid with you. So that is, that is an, uh, another aside there. But going back, so these are, there are very interesting stories how the whole cotton itself basically had its turns uh, and how uh, it was the epicenter always moved around and then again uh, the, after the British it was okay it came back to India actually because a lot of these machines also came back all of these second hand machines came back from uh, Europe to India and so a lot of spinning started happening the mechanical spinning started happening here and we went into it. so going back just to understand uh, what should be the better way for this cotton value chain is basically reviving of the livelihoods, local livelihoods, ensure that the economy is thrusted into the villages and into the women. That is what was basically so fascinating for this old man. Because when it is a distributed economy and when it, when it goes into the women's hand, it comes back to the, every household, it comes to the kitchen, it comes to uh, educate the kids, it comes back to take care of their health. Unlike where it goes into the men's hand, there are so many distractions, and, and so and the whole process itself then becomes a decentralized process, which is also very important. This would look towards the rural India, it would look towards villages, it would look towards spreading of the economy, and it would spread. I mean, there would be more, so many more activities, and so many more people who would be involved in each and every value chain for that. And cotton value chain was one of the best examples for that. So that is how it should be. Just to compare the man versus machine, I mean, say basically, if one person can just press one switch and uh, basically enable hundreds and thousands of shirts to be made, if, I, if the whole thing is done by machine, if some uh, one lakh or uh, seventy thousand spindles are running at such a speed and just uh, um, manufacturing yarn, and then they are uh, made in power looms, and then they are cut with one cut ten thousand shirts. Machines spit out shirts. 
is that a better deal or multiple hands touch this as a shirt one single shirt basically if it is a small scale there would be a farmer who would grow it which itself will have multiple hands they don't have any time account for household will be involved in it and from there there will be a group of women who would spin the yarn and from there it will go to a weaver behind the weaver every weaver there is a woman who does the reeling who does the starching who does the sizing they said who helps him in the warping and then then there is a dyer then there is a tailor each each of these stages there is a human being there are many human beings there are many lives that are attached so if uh, if if i have to have a shirt which will basically touch 5 to 10 lives in life it works is that a better deal or somebody sitting there and touch one machine a huge given those machine which will spin the yarn and give one better. is that a better idea so the man who says machine question has always been in front of us we all have to sit and think about it as to which is better if i got to tell you what went wrong in the mechanization in the industrialization in the corporatization in the capitalism model of this basically well basically the cost of production the cost of the energy the cost of livelihoods the cost of livelihoods that are displaced the cost of the capital is the cost of the npas in that today's beautiful world of where you always hear about the npas become such a common terminology the cost of pollution none of this is taken care none of this is discussed about none of this comes into the purview of there so it i there this is also one of this whole value chain also ends up being one of the highly exploitative values and there wherever if you see even in their big industries it will be unworkable condition for the women and children and people that work in that the workforce is never taken care of the workforce is always uh, <clears throat> exploited so to say and not paid well and they will be in very very hard conditions so similarly if you are talking of uh, where does the profit go is it distributed no and what happens to the environment is anybody bothered about it no and there is absolutely no real value behind it and there is absolutely no real cost the true cost is not even taken into consideration but it is highly toxic it is highly manipulative it is highly unfair it is very big it's very bad it is uh, also uh, eats up a lot of energy and uh, throws a lot of pollution and spoils up this is just an example most of the dying in india for example takes place in uh, tripura tirod belt so this is what this is a river there which is a beautiful river which is flowing for uh, thousands of years and now just because we started dying for most of them we converted a river into absolutely black brackish absolutely unpotable you can't even touch it it went to such an extent that in erod for example when i went there and visited a farmer who said he was quitting farming because if you just dig 5 meters into the soil the water is black it cannot be basically uh, yeah but fed to the plants forget the portability of it drinking water was just a nightmare there all this because this was a small town that was actually dying for the whole of europe for so many years now suddenly between bangladesh and uh, erod we would be dying 80% of the dying for the world might be happening as though the europeans cannot die i mean dye they basically they would go up to mars they can do whatever they will plan various things but they would not do the dying because the chemical dying is such a very notorious industry it's one of the most polluting industry next to leather it is also uh, also to india just for your information if you just have to quickly know what all hurts us these are some of the slides that will tell you what's happening behind each of these there are phthalates there are dioxin there is trichloroethylene there is a diclosan there is a dural and there are so many chemicals that come in most of them have a recorded um, they have all been recorded for various ailments how chronic diseases how they enable and there some of them are proven carcinogens all these come into our in a, into our lives so that basically they come they are going to skin is your largest um, organ in your body and that's basically being in, uh, that's going to come into contact with all this on a reg very regular basis it's such a very bad uh, product at the end of the day when so many things are used or a very simple a t-shirt or other things we talk about this we pair there is polyester or a nylon or a lycra 
or a rayon that is included into it. There are so many problems that come into that. And at the end of the life cycle of this, when you throw away a t-shirt thinking it's over, it's the end of life for it, it creates more problem. It cannot basically degrade. It, it, it breaks down and it breaks down to thousands of microfibers which come back to you through the fishes or through something else. From your water bodies, it comes back to us. It is a huge amount of, it comes to the water also. It comes to the water body, so it comes to the water, drinking water, everywhere. So there is so much of microfiber, so much of chemicals that you will and, uh, by, uh, and none of these will degrade. That is also a very important thing. So at the end of my life, what happens if I were to throw my shirt from what is made of from tula, for example, even the buttons are made from cotton, uh, means from coconut uh, shell. So if you just throw the, the, the tula shirt out, it will just, it's a matter of time, in three to six months, it would be basically, it would have turned into soil, it would degrade. So that would, that's what would happen when it is, everything is basically totally cotton and natural fibers are used, like cotton, and uh, when everything else used in it is natural. So there are so many things in our modern clothing, it's very important for us to understand, if you find a beautiful color shirt, if you think only that particular peach color shirt, or this dark color pant or a red color is what will be attractive and felt attractive by your others, by your spouses or by your friends and others. So very, very wrong. There is a lot of chemical effluents that have been thrown. Mother Earth can has been damaged so much. The environment around you has been damaged so much. The air and water have been touched so much, disturbed so much. The whole life cycle has been disturbed so much. And at the end of the life also, it doesn't have a good ending. So it's very, very important for us to understand this value chain that is there available today and why is it necessary for us to think of it and move away from it. It's good. And as I told you, sometimes the investment behind it, the power requirements of it is also huge. It's a resource guzzler. It's a huge investment guzzler. Today, if you were to set up a spinning mill, for example, the banks will not treat you if you are not talking anything about one lakh spindles. One lakh spindles means literally uh, one, one spindle will uh, be an equivalent of one kilo of yarn that can be produced in a day, roughly, which means it displaces one lakh women who are spinning by hand. That's one first thing. And if you have to do such humongous thing, so basically you are always supposed to handle a lot of stuff, so which means there will be a lot of uh, pollution that is concentrated in one place. It also means a lot of stock is concentrated in one place. So which means you will also have to play a lot of tricks in one place. You just have this. So it's basically a lot of complication, a lot more complication than what you can actually think. Of. Just to give you an example, I mean, if you are putting a shirt, 50 times the weight of your shirt, the 50 times weight of your dress is basically the carbon footprint of you. Basically. It's a very, very, very uh, uh, hugely uh, carbon deficit. And the fossil fuel also behind it is not, uh, it's a huge thing because the cotton itself, the whole cotton value chain is framed in such a way today that it travels a lot. Cotton is grown in America, it would come all the way basically uh, somewhere to uh, Bangladesh, for example, to be processed. And from there, it will go all the way to Western Europe to be sold, which means it will travel thousands of miles. So the, mile, the, uh, foot, mile, the foot miles behind it is going to be so high. And it's here that I want you to think of Tula. On one side, we have, we talked about so many ills, so many problems of the whole cotton value chain, including the investments. And on another side, we are talking of a Tula where we, we have rain fed cotton, so which we don't even pump out water from under the underground. It's just basically, basically uh, dependent on the rainfall. It's basically organic cotton. It's with uh, our traditional Indian seeds which is basically then hand spun, which is hand woven, which is natural dye. Dyeing is again a huge uh, polluting thing, as, I, as we saw. So natural dye, uh, manually tailored, which means at each stage, that is more than one or two lives. And at the end, and they are all paid dignified compensation, very, I mean, a decent salary, so that they are basically full. I mean, they have to basically remain in these things. A lot of these... Uh, Livelihoods will be lost. A lot of this art and craft will be lost. Basically. So it's very important for us to basically understand this, support this, work with these people and ensure that such things stay.
And at the end of the day, when you become a customer and buy a garment, you can be very, very, uh, we can be very happy. It not only tax this five to ten light because it is also going to be the lightest garment that you can sport, technologically speaking. And what well, about? So now from here, I would want, I would see the uh, Khadi value chain also. Khadi value chain also has its problems. Khadi doesn't pay very high. For example, a Khadi worker, uh, in a, in a tailor in Khadi, uh, to stitch a pant would be paid some seven rupees. And stitch some 10 pants in a day, you would get only 80 rupees. Hand spinners were paid four plus three, seven rupees basically, which means they would get only 150 rupees a day. A weaver is paid 15 to 20 rupees per meter, which means they would, uh, that's the norm of the market. And uh, mind you, weaving is one of the weaving it's of this uh, of this crafts. One of the second largest employers in India next to agriculture. So it's very important for us to ensure that these are having better compensation. So at, uh, what we did at uh, Tula is we would basically give more than two to three times to the spinners, more than three times to the weavers, and they are the traders. All to the extent that these people basically, and even to a farmer, we always give uh, close to double. Uh, what it ensured was basically better uh, return and better compensation for all those people. We also did one more additional thing. That's why you see a star there near the viewers. Weaving itself, as I was telling you something back, also mean it also means a lot of uh, it has to be size. I mean, there's, there's something called sizing that is done, there is a starching that is done, then it's uh, there's a <clears throat> reeling that happens, there are bobbin that is wound, you know, and those are all done by the women. And in India, when you say a weaver, you only think of a man. When you pay a weaver, you only pay to the man who does that. There's, a, there's so much of work like this that I said is done by women and they are ignored totally. They are not even paid for it. They are not even considered. And weaving is always considered as a household act activity and the man is paid. Even the paltry 150, 200 rupees that they make in a day is paid only to the man. So the woman ends up doing a lot of work from the early morning and that's about it. So we said that is to be recognized as a separate job. That is supposed to be recognized, and so we started recognizing it as a separate. And they are paid extra. We pay around twenty-five to thirty for a woman. That is, which we think is very important. We all have, to. so it cannot be behind that. Equipment. So what the market pays, as I told you, for the weaver is fifteen rupees to twenty rupees. Fifteen rupees, and in that, basically, is also the woman who is hidden behind. So we said no, this will be separate. We give more than fifty rupees to the farmer, to the weaver, and there is a twenty-five to thirty that goes to the woman. There is an end. So. We basically end up paying a lot more than what we wanted. We were consciously doing it. We also explain to our customers. That's also one of the reasons that you might have to pay like the higher than a rate for this, but it is loudly worth it. This is what would happen to the money that you spend basically with us. So if you give up for a shirt, I mean, yes, when we started, it was uh, 600 rupees a shirt. Today it is not, it has increased, but <clears throat> where it goes, 8% goes to the cotton farmer. 13 percent goes to the spinner, 8 percent to the dyer, 23 percent to the weaver, 15 percent to the tailor, 12 percent wastages because of during a conversion from uh, cotton to yarn, yarn when it is woven. At every stage, there is a way, there is a wastage of cotton, and then there is administration and transport, and there is a 10 percent of margin which is used for any incidental expense. There is no uh, private owner, there is no ownership which will where the profit will accrue. There is no profit accrual. Everything is shared between only these people, the primary producers. It could be the farmers, it could be the spinners, weavers, and all of them. We started with 15 farmers, 30 acres in Tamil Nadu, um, and basically went on to it. We expanded it into uh, Karnataka, Maharashtra, and Tamil Nadu. I mean, uh, we work in three states now. It's not very difficult. Economics wise, I think we should talk another day. We just had 15 friends for pulling uh, one lakh each, and there. so 15 lakh was what was put in. And it basically helped us to the, um, grow it and expand it into three states for the same thing because the harvest time is different in these three states. I mean, I'm not getting to that very deep right now. Yes, this is something that we call as Kora, which is the natural color of cotton. It's very important it will be very in, uh, because even when you are doing natural dye, there is uh, there is a waste. There has got to be a very um, good waste management because at the same time you are thinking of so many hospitals. There is so many blue uh, flowers basically or pomegranates and you are going to basically there's going to be waste after you extract color so we will have to have a good waste management even for composting them and uh, so if you have to be if you have to have a real light garment on yourself it is this this cotton is not even bleached there will be no bleaching it will not look white it will look off white that's what we call as kora it's the best thing that you can actually sport a kora in that sense
I'll not get into this. The BD cotton is absolutely a big no. That is where our journey started opposing the BD cotton and said BD cotton is a very bad thing for the farmers. And so that, that's why we started uh, asking them to grow it organically. From there, we uh, moved to uh, traditional Indian cotton being grown organically. BD cotton has had a lot of problems even today. The deaths have only increased. There are a lot more suicides, a lot more deaths, and a lot more pesticides being sold in all these places where BD cotton is adopted. So it is a very bad thing. We have proof. These are all from government data only. They might be telling us a different story, but this is the real story. It is from the government uh, data. Maybe. So the yield has not increased. Do you see the pesticides have increased? Anyway. So that is one of the reasons why we think it should be the desi cotton that should come back. Because the desi cotton also means when, you, when the people grow the traditional Indian cotton, it is not just full of cotton. And, and, uh, the farm on the field is not full of cotton. There are many things that they grow. It is always about biodiversity. It's about cotton and crop, crop diversity. So they don't just grow cotton. They grow millets along with it. They grow vegetables along with it. They grow chili along with it. They grow coriander along with it. In some parts of India, like um, Northeast, they even grow paddy along with it as a, it's a crop. It's a beautiful thing. And cotton is incidental. So, uh, so there is no way a, a farmer can be into crisis if, this, if that was the case. How do we do our marketing? Predominantly, we were doing it through exhibitions. It has become a big problem now for the last four months. So that has closed down. We don't have, we, we can't go, we can't think of exhibitions for another few months. This is going to be the problem, same problem for a lot of us who are working with our artisans, who are in the Khadi, many Khadi Sanstas, all of them will be having problems. People who are listening here, and each of you should also take it forward. It's very important. For us, it was a very well set market. The last line, we always had more demand than the supply till now. Last three months has come, it's COVID, nothing to blame anything else, but then that's where we are stuck. We are also experimenting, we keep experimenting. There are a lot of new colors that come with us. There are a lot of new things that we try. There is also this Mr. Yan that we have tried, which can be used for crochets and embroidery. These are our group of milk kote near Mysore. That's where this, this is where many, most of our weaving happens. It's a beautiful weaving center. That's where, and these are all our weavers. They're all smiling as you see. These are our spinners near Gandhi Gram. That's where we work with them in South Tamil Nadu. And they're also a whole lot of women who are very happy. It's a very interesting uh, place to go, basically. Is Khadi costly? This is something that people keep asking us. Khadi is not costly if you take everything into account. An NPA, for example, a textile industry is the third largest NPA by producing. I mean, NPA is non pam I think you all know it's the the Malyar gate, where the uh, loan taken by the company is not given back. So there is a huge amount of it in the textile industry, basically. They are the top three always, uh, even the higher than the airlines industry. So that's a sad thing. And if you're all thinking you're just buying a t-shirt for 300 rupees and nothing else, the NPA comes and puts a hole in your pocket. The pollution comes and puts a hole in your pocket. The river comes and uh, puts a hole in your pocket. Each of these, the, 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 each of these is not value. That's why you are not knowing it, and the, the hole in your pocket is not visible to you, unfortunately. So, if you were to just see it, comparing an apple to a banana, yes, kadi will look costly, but it is a, all, all these costs are really worth it because these are used to basically pay some human beings behind. And who are not polluting, who are very, very, uh, it's produced in a very eco friendly way. It is basically very healthy for the environment as well as for the ones who will, uh, who will support it. So it's very important. It doesn't display livelihoods, uh, it, uh, it doesn't displace livelihood, it doesn't uh, corrupt and contaminate water. There are a lot of things. So it's very, very important that we uh, support it, support such activities. Tula is one of them. I'm not talking only about Tula. At Tula, what do we have for you? We would have shirts, kurtas, pajamas, um, yoga, yoga pants, dupattas, towels, hankies, kids wear. Today we even have masks because we think a mask that's going to be on your face some 8 to 10 hours in a day should be non-toxic, should be breathing, should be nice on your skin, should not be leaving behind some chemical or some other things. So that's also one of the reasons that we are also producing masks, basically. It's a very interesting uh, uh, range of products that you have. What can you do? 
I think we all have to understand. We all have to ensure that another 10 more people understand these and take it to them. It's very important that these eco-friendly values go. The value chain itself has to be understood by each of us. We have to propagate it also and support anything that is handmade, anything that is artisanal, anything that would support rural livelihoods, anything that would bolster local economy. It's very important for each of us to support, patronize, spread these words. It's very, very, when I say support, you should be buying. But we are also from the environmentally sensitive and sensible people. So we are not saying you should just blindly buy. If you have to buy, you buy. And if you have to buy, please buy from the Sarkhadi or something that is handcrafted. And if you can buy Tula, we will be very happy, doubly happy when you do. So, but we also please spread the word, help them. Today, as I was telling you, the Tula example itself, our store, we have only one store in Chennai that has been closed for four months now because of the extended uh, lockdown in Chennai. So we have not had any sale for four months, but we continue. By these four months, our artisans continue. They, kind of, they were spinning, they were weaving, they were all being paid. There have been a lot more product produced. So we are sitting on huge piles of stock. That would be the case with a lot of Khadi Sanstas. That would be the case with a lot of people who are working. That would be the case with a lot of designers who are working with Khadi and weavers, with Khadi spinners. So it's very important if you can, and if you have to buy, please do that. And if you can, and you should all take it on yourself. Each one of you, you should enter. And we are all very good at uh, online. See, online is the world for Amazons and Flipkarts, and they again will put a pocket in your hole by being big NPAs, not paying or uh, running away or whatever. But we can't afford to do that, and we can't be fighting with them. We can We are not. And many of our viewers will not even know about online. So imagine. So if there are people who are helping them, there may be small NGOs, there will be small volunteers, a group of volunteers will be helping it. It's very, very important for us to basically ensure such people are helping. If you are an IT person and if you can help them create, help create something for them, please do that. If you can just take and uh, put it in a mail, put it in a WhatsApp and send it to another 10, 10 friends and ensure that five more people buy, it's a very good thing. Each of you can basically do. What is more important is to think of this whole value chain. It is important that it is highly polluting industry. We have to think of it. We, have, we all have to pitch in there and stop buying these things. A blue color jeans. A blue jeans is not jeans was handmade. Jeans was made with a lot of uh, natural products. They were made only with indigo. It is not the case anymore. Jeans is a very, very highly polluting thing and it also uh, takes a lot of water. So each of these has a big story, sad story behind it. And each of the outer rate has very interesting stories behind it and it touches many human beings. So it's very, very important that we all look at that and basically ensure we can be a part of this and you can patronize such things. These are some of the people behind it. Jay Shankar, Kavita Kurganti, Sahaja Samrudha, Janapada Seva Trust, Balaji Shankar, Tara Aslam, Vishala Padmanabhan and yours truly. We've all been part of this. It has been a very interesting journey. Fantastic. I can understand why and how the whole world through those years, historically, for thousands of years, has fallen from cotton and its value chain. Absolutely. If there is a chance, if you want to do something, please go. There are 100 things that you can do with it. It's a fantastic product. And there are so many things that one can think of and do. It. It's a beautiful value chain. What else do we do? We also deal with food, as uh, Mantara was saying. We have the restore at Boyfram. They are 100% plastic free organic food uh, vending uh, centers. It's a very interesting concept also. You should also be supporting organic stores. You should be buying your, your own kitchen and your own plate should always be organic and sand free of all these chemicals that come into the food production and food processing. All these are very important for us and this is how it is. And uh, I think I will stop here and uh, see if there are any questions. If there are not, any questions? You can all be happy to go up soon on a Saturday. I said yes. There are quite a few questions that uh, I'd like to read them out. Okay. Yeah. Just a moment. Okay. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Yes. Tell me. Yeah. So, um, so this question is from Kanan. Yeah. Um, Tula is a brand. Tula uses organic Indian short staple cotton, which are organic and does not use scarce. He is one of the volunteers. I think he would have just put that there. Oh, yeah. okay. 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 So I'll move on. 
Uh, uh, this question is from Shri uh, Shri Vardhan Reddy. Yeah. I have few questions regarding organic cotton uh, farming. Um, he says he's from Mahbub Nagar district of Telangana, where cotton cultivation is done in large scale. So he wants to know if he, you can guide people who are willing to grow cotton in organic way, like seed collection, package of uh, package of properties, and also buy back uh, method from Tula. Yeah, one thing, one thing. Don't put such pressure on us. Everybody who is talking about it, we have our own farmers. So I can't move away from them and it's not easy for us to buy from another 100 farmers, another 50 farmers. It's not easy. If it is possible, yes. Buyback is not the primary way of expansion. Okay, But buyback should be done. I mean, so basically you should form a group of farmers. We can share our uh, experiences. We can ensure you don't make these mistakes. We will help you in uh, any of this. And for growing and cultivation, of course, yes, there are groups. There are group like uh, <clears throat> CSA who are... Uh, who will uh, have a lot of experts who can help you? Yes, definitely, I can put you on. We can come uh, come online, offline to me. We can do that. But we don't assure people where when we advise this, it doesn't mean we will buy everything that you can grow as cotton or to grow as food. Basically. No, that is not very easily possible. That is not possible for anybody for that matter. Uh, but yes, definitely, we will share our experts' numbers. We will also share and tell you where where you can buy, get some seeds. Who else is doing in Karan, in Tamil Nadu for us? I mean, this is in Andhra, in Andhra, for example. We can always get there. It's, it's okay. And we, uh, we we definitely procure only organic cotton. And that is also where we are working with them from the initial stage. Where seed itself, we have a control. We know where the seeds have come from. That's how we work. Yeah. Okay. Moving on. The next question is from Sandhya Kiran. Twisted yarn or crochet sounds like a good idea. Any plans of making natural dyed threads for embroidery? Yeah, that's what that is. Uh, that twisted yarn is, is natural dyed. We are experimenting. We are working on all those. It's, it's just a matter of time that we can be, we actually have a couple of. Uh, so basically, I mean, I can understand that you have understood it. When you are using uh, these yarn for uh, embroidery, it should also not run colors. It's very very important. Yes, that's something that we are working on. We have succeeded, I could say. We have some of those today. Okay. Uh, this question is from Kavya. Uh, please share your views on azo free dyes that are available in the market. Sorry, I also read something else. Uma, yes. We even we are waiting for it. Yes, it is very important. That's a very bad. Uh, it's because we are working with the Indian cotton. It's which is coarse and short staple. It doesn't make very soft bed linen. That is why we are waiting for. We have now identified a long staple cotton. There is experiment going on. We would basically try and use it this year. If we succeed, we will get there Uma, very soon. Thank you. Thank you for being a big support and always with us and uh, aching us like this for new products. Thank you. And I come back to Kavya's question now. Uh, your share, share your views on it. As of free dice is just one part of the toxicity removes. There are still more, more toxicity in that. Still, there is a lot of chemicals that come in. So it's very important for us to avoid everything. But as of free dice is one step forward. It is definitely good. It's definitely better than your uh, 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 dice, basically. Yes, but I think it's better to go for natural dice. That should be the way to go forward. Because we all have to redefine what is beauty. What is beautiful color? What is a brilliant color? No, none of these are. A sharp red. A dark pink is not a good color. Please understand that. Any dark color that can come in is the dark means a lot of pollution. Has been. A lot of water has been used. There's been a lot of exploitation, both of environment and ecology, and people that have happened behind it. Sir, uh, would you like to uh, stop your screen share so that everyone can view your screen? Correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I'm moving on. This question is from related to style and fashion. Style and fashion is the last thing that comes to our mind because we were not designers before. We didn't have any clue about all this. So that was not our primary even today, I think that should not be I mean say garbage is a garbage after all. That's all. So we are not there to um, uh, get very good styles. We are not going to talk of curves and bring it and show your shoulder better, your, uh, hide your stomach and all that. No, we will never be there. One. Two, 
we will also not be into the big fashion industry in that sense. We don't want to be. And we don't want each of these. I mean, fashion industry, where, where it will lead is, it's an unfortunate thing. The Western world today is talking of one day wear, party wear. That's where the style of the fashion finally will take you to. They can afford it because there are people who will die here. There are rivers which can die here in a, in a developing nation like India, Bangladesh. And they can basically buy, buy a shirt for $1, $2, $10, okay, which comes purely out of exploitation. So, and yes, if there are, there are a lot of uh, designers who are very well, who work with their heart. There are many who work with us also. There are many we have around. Yes, through them. We are redefining. There are contemporary uh, styles that have come in. There are Khadi itself is now today evolving very beautifully in the hands of many of these people. That is the start of style and fashion that we would want to portray, follow, and encourage. That's how it will be. Okay, um, sir, I, I would like to pick the questions that are related to the topic today. So, yeah. forgive me if I'm skipping a few questions, everyone. So, this question is from Apurva. She says, uh, produced cotton is exported from India and we import very costly fabric and clothes. How can we set up a processing uh, plant here too? Are there any manual processing methods? Yeah, see, I, my my um, primary advice to anybody who wants to start is just travel around, move around, check. Go and talk to various old uh, khadi sanstars. Ask them what was there. There should be somebody. Some there will be a lot of weavers in mind. There will be um, spinners, spinning machines that are there. You will have to basically check. As I was telling, you, when know, I deliberately went through the cotton uh, history also. Right? Almost all the parts of the world, whether they grow cotton or not, have uh, had uh, spinning and weaving happening in their countries, including countries like Switzerland, including uh, Russia. All these countries where six months they will not have anything else when they are uh, down under snow. So, it is possible, it's very much possible and there are uh, many, I mean say it's easy to revive some of these old uh, khadis and stars or old uh, spinning units and it is basically easy to refurbish some of these old machines than sitting around. But on the other side, we also want technologists to come in and basically work on smaller machines and break. See, in the spinning, we have to crack the pre-spinning for which still the machine is used, but it has been used from khadis here. So that part has to be attended to immediately by the technologists. We have been uh, telling and talking to people that's been happening, but just 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 to tell you, yes. All right. Next question is from. Is that right? Or uh, I didn't see the question, so I'm not sure if I had uh, this. Yes. Moving on. The next. Um, next question is from Prabhu R. Um, he says, are you seeing any possibilities that India will control the pollution emitting from the textile units? Sorry? Ah, yeah, okay. Are you seeing any possibilities that India? Yes. There is a possibility if all of us start waking up, all of us start questioning, writing about it, write your pollution. There is, there are rules. Pollution control boards have rules. Just that they don't, they connive with the industry and they don't apply it. Even in Tripur, that's what was happening. Now, there have been a court order which came in and there have been a lot of correction happened. There are many things in Karur Kar and other places. There have been um, a lot of them have got together and set up. They should have done it long back. They should have done it on their own, which they don't do. These few bucks that are saved is very important for an industry because they are heartless and they are driven only by profits. That is where we lost. That is where we have lost it out. But it is possible. There has to be stricter controls and regulations. There has to be stricter rules. It is very important for all. If you were to use this something that is highly toxic, it is your responsibility to see to it that it is when it goes out of your factory, it has to be degradable. It has it should not be affecting the environment. It cannot have no business affecting anything, including agriculture. That is the only way it should be done. Yes, it is important that it is happening. Yeah. And that is why I'm saying, why should you even have a control for it? It's like uh, killing somebody painless. Let us go for alternates. We have safer alternates. Choose them. We don't even need it. You don't need correction there. Stop it. Okay. Um, moving on, we, uh, I'm going to take one question from the uh, from the emails that we received. Yeah. From Usha. She, uh, she asks, how do we know the organic fabrics and where to procure directly at a reachable cost for our production? 
sorry ba you got repeated um so how do we know where we can find the organic uh, fabrics from and how can we procure them is her question okay mm. that's a tricky question but uh, this question specifically primarily uh, you can find answers only by talking to them if you are talking to one of us one of our uh, team team members you can ask them where is the cotton how are you sure it's organic if they don't give you convincing answer you should not be buy and be for for that matter we know the every farmer who is growing it we know where it is we trace it back to them we can tell you where it is grown how it's grown and why is it grown or where it is and then where it is spun you can also visit our weaving center you are all welcome there but that's how it is so it's very important for it's just a matter of a few questions that you can ask an interaction with people which is what would end in you getting to know what exactly is happening here it's the same about the food also when a shop we just wish to say that if they don't know then that's where the mistakes happen that's where the it advertently or inadvertently so it's very important for us to engage in a conversation and then try to understand more about them talk to them write to us ask more questions only if your comments is continue um so there is one message from uma she says all the best to tula hope you're able to sell online soon Uh, i'm sure there'd be a lot of people interested in buying such comfortable clothes perfect lockdown wear thank you thank you uma yes okay. i'm also saying there are two questions that i saw the uh, shikara what yes. is about uh, some somebody saying i'm using i am using tula dresses for the past two years it's great wearing it my request is to think of inner wear clothes which is not available right now okay and uh, where is the other one yeah Yes, that's right. We are thinking of a lot of products. Like, say, somebody was—I mean, Uma was asking about uh, bed linens. Yes, we have to get there. But the problem is, uh, uh, Sri Prasad, the inner garments from us would become become very costly. Then uh, Sri Prasad himself would uh, turn around and say, "What should I spend so much for an inner wear?" That's also a problem because we are about uh, giving. Uh, fair compensation to the people so that that's also another consideration that we are we always keep thinking of what will basically sell and what will not shock people as a price that's also important but definitely we are thinking of it we will come out with this in a way because we think it's important what is directly in touch with our skin it has to be organic and good that's that's something that we are always thinking of okay and i think that's pretty much it one need to one here can Sorry. Um, I was just saying we saw some someone else also said they had bought or they were asking about this. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. Um, I would actually request one of your uh, volunteers to leave their um, sorry, leave Tula's website details and phone numbers on the chat so that the participants can note it down. And uh, uh, other everyone else on the call right now, we will be uh, posting the same webinar on our YouTube channel on our sacred space. and you can uh, watch it over there you can share it with others and also we'll post uh, the last details on our facebook page also so i would um, so with your permission i would like to now call um, ms nanda and nand kumar to give a vote of thanks before we end the session Anand, you have uh, connected the dots, uh, the science, the history, the uh, social exploitation, understanding of the value chain, the environmental toxicity involved in our choice of clothing. Um, I will definitely be asking all our, um, uh, all the people who come to Sacred Space to buy Tula, uh, understanding that the amount that. Tula has really supported the whole weaving community during this lockdown period. Um, one request from my side is uh, infant pillows. So I always hesitated when I put my baby down on a pillow, which I knew was, you know, uh, not uh, of organic material. So infant pillows from me, and um, I love wearing tula. My son's favorite choice of clothing is tula, and um, i look forward to um hearing more and understanding more deeply the uh, all the 
consequences of what clothes we choose to wear. Thank you so much. And um, we will be, uh, as you give us information, we will be posting it on our site as well. Thanks a lot, Sarah. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Bye. See you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mr. Nanandu. Thank you so much, Tara, ma'am, for being here to, today. Uh, just one last thing. Um, we have another tuning in session coming up next Saturday from 5 to 6 p.m. It is on Edible Weeds, taken by Dr. Nina Sen Gupta. So you can please uh, register with us. You have our details. You can log in to our Facebook uh, and our Instagram page to register for the session. And uh, with this, I'm going to now end the session. Uh, thank, thank, Tara, thank you. Special thanks to you. It is a pleasure to see you and I feel like we, I've understood so much, learned so much in this one hour. Thank you. Thank you.